In our last couple of lessons, we looked at cultural explanations of ethnic inequality. These explanations say that the reason why ethnic minorities tend to be disadvantaged is because of problems in their own culture. They might have values which conflict with the wider society, or they may have specific traditions which hold them back in the workplace. They also might suffer from language barriers which are inevitably going to cause some issues as they transition into the workplace and education. But what these explanations fail to recognise is that ethnic minorities can often experience structural barriers in society which are totally outside of their control. And also, these explanations tend to be consensus-based, operating on the idea that society has a shared agreement on norms and values, totally ignoring the fact that conflict can also play a role. So perhaps to fill this gap in understanding, we can look at the perspective of the foremost structural conflict theory, Marxism. So today's lesson will be looking at the Marxist view of ethnic inequality as a whole. The next lesson will look at some specific studies and concepts. But for now let's look at how they generally view the issues of ethnic inequality and racism, and then consider some positive and negative evaluations. Classical Marxism and Karl Marx himself had very little to say on the issue of race. As ever for Karl Marx, his most defining characteristic of what makes a person was their relationship to the means of production. Were they part of the capitalist bourgeoisie or the working class proletariat? So Karl Marx's most simple explanation for ethnic inequality was that ethnic minorities tended to be in the working class proletariat. But when the American Civil War broke out, obviously fought on the issue of race, Karl Marx added some depth to his explanation. He made two arguments. Firstly, he said that capitalism creates racism through its need to justify enslavement of people. Secondly, he says that racism performs a handy role for capitalism because it decreases the class consciousness of the working class, giving them someone else to focus their attention on rather than looking towards the bourgeoisie. So since then, Karl Marx and the others that have succeeded him have developed those ideas and detailed them to make them more sophisticated. But probably the best way to understand the Marxist view of racism and ethnic inequality is to recap the idea of the base superstructure theory. Now just to remind ourselves what that is, essentially Karl Marx believed that the most important thing for every society was how it fulfilled its basic needs and wants. So he called that the base, which is essentially uh, a society's economic system. For us, that would be capitalism. Then everything else, such as your media, your politics, your ideology, virtually every social institution you can think of, fits around that and is built on top of it. That would be the superstructure. But what's important to remember is that the base, the economic system, creates everything else that's not to do with production and then those systems such as politics and ideology then reinforce the base. So there's a cycle at play where the economic system basically determines the structure of the rest of society and then everything in that society then works to preserve that economic base. Perhaps you're starting to see where racism fits into all of this. Essentially Racism fits very nicely into that cycle. Capitalism creates racism, and then racism helps to reinforce capitalism. Now, that raises two questions. First, how does capitalism create racism? Secondly, how does it benefit capitalism? Now, at first you might be thinking, oh, those Marxists blaming another bad thing on capitalism. But let's look at exactly what they say as to why it emerged. So according to this Marxist publication, racism did not really exist before capitalism. Yes, prejudice existed, but not on the basis of race. It's only when capitalism needed to justify the slave trade, a huge source of profits for the capitalist class, did racism begin to emerge. And so, according to them, Racism was just one part of capitalism's ideological armory against the working class. Now in this following video, we can see a very similar argument being expressed 
by someone of a Marxist position. You'll notice how he seems to talk about the bourgeoisie and the proletariat as if they have totally separate views and interests. A very Marxist position. They started uh, stealing people from Africa, ship bringing them here, and white and to explain why this was different, why this was not endangering the white working class. They had to say, well, look, these are a different group of people. We wouldn't, this, these are not even people. We wouldn't even do this to you. And at the time, you know, they could say Irish were different groups of people too, because Irish were not considered white yet. The theory that of race was invented to justify slavery. Now, before that, they talked about things in nature, nations. It's not like there weren't wars or people didn't hate other people before that, but it was always talked about in terms of nations. It was nations and sometimes there'd be descriptions of people, but the idea that this nation and that nation were related because they looked the same was not one that existed. So this idea of, of race was put forward to justify uh, slavery and to say, look, these are a lower form of being. You should not feel united with them. This is not your problem. This is that. So there was a need for racism. So just to summarize, he's arguing that essentially racism was created so that white working class people didn't feel like they were threatened by slavery. They had to feel like it only applied to black Africans. Now from here on out, he then begins to explain why that need for racism still continues today. Similarly, now, there's the same need, right? Because stereotypes about black folks are used to explain to the white working class that poverty is the cause of people making their own bad choices, as opposed to poverty being, the co being, a necess a, being necessitated by capitalism. So just to summarize, the Marxist position is that racism was created in order to justify slavery. But as that man just said a second ago, it remains a necessity for capitalism because we need to convince uh, the proletariat especially that the very poor situation of ethnic minority neighborhoods and communities is because of their own choices or because of their culture not because of the structural flaws inherent in capitalism. So then it comes to the second of those two questions. How does racism and ethnic inequality benefit the structure of capitalism? And Marxists say it does this in three ways. Firstly, ethnic minorities can be used to form most of the reserve army of labour. Secondly, the presence of ethnic minorities can keep white working class people in an insecure position where they feel like they have to take low wages. And thirdly, ethnic minorities can be used to scapegoat the failings of capitalism. Let's take the first of these benefits. Marxists argue that there is a reserve army of labour which consists of the unemployed that capitalists can immediately hire when the economy starts booming. But as wages begin to rise because unemployment falls, inevitably the economy shrinks again. And inevitably the first people to be laid off are those people who have just been hired. So the reserve army of labour is always kept in a kind of state of poverty and insecurity. Marxists argue that ethnic minorities are a big part of this reserve army of labour along with women and the young. They would look at the unemployment rate in many ethnic minority communities as evidence for this claim. So that's the first benefit that ethnic inequality performs for capitalism. It makes sure that there's never a shortage of labour, no matter what the economic circumstances. And perhaps more importantly, it ensures that there's never a shortage of cheap labour that can be employed. But this also performs a second benefit for capitalism, because whilst they are that reserve army of labour, the white working class people who are currently employed feel an anxiety that those ethnic minorities can move in and take their jobs. But then the people from the future came along and, and now we're out of work too! 
Oh, they took our jib. They took your jib. They took your jib. Yeah. Now, obviously, feeling like someone is going to replace you is going to make you a lot less confident when you go to appeal for a raise or perhaps ask for higher wages. So that way, it can mean that capitalists continue to push down on wages through exploitation and also push down on working conditions. Marxists believe that the proletariat is encouraged to view ethnic minorities with suspicion. They are encouraged to look at them as though they are waiting in the wings to replace them the moment that they are perhaps not working hard enough or the moment they ask for higher wages. Therefore, this system gets the proletariat to work hard for a system which inherently alienates them, but it also gets them to accept dirt poor wages because the system is structured in a way where to have low wages is better than having no wages at all. Now that leads me on to the third benefit that racism and ethnic inequality affords the capitalist system. If you are encouraging the proletariat to view ethnic minorities with suspicion and essentially view them as people just waiting in the wings to replace them for work, then with that racism that you're encouraging, the moment that capitalism has a structural flaw or has a recession, as happened in 1929 or 2008, you then have someone that the working class look to for blame in the, in the form of a scapegoat. So, essentially, rather than turn uh, their ire and their anger to the bourgeoisie or the bankers, say, for 2008, they will instead look to the ethnic minorities who often are closer to them and turn their anger on them. And that obviously means that the capitalist system continues to operate without the fear of revolution. There does appear to be some evidence for the claim that recession and economic crisis are correlated with racism or a breakdown in race relations. One study from the Journal of Social Psychology found that when there is periods of economic scarcity during a recession, so that's when essentially there is low employment or uh, when there are low resources and wages are low, there is a rise in racial discrimination, um, particularly against black minorities. My own research, where I did some playing around with Google Trends, found that interest in the BNP was spiked in 2008 and 2009, and then began to slowly tail off as the economy improved. And historically, we have to remember that Hitler's Nazi party had basically vanished into political insignificance. That was until the 1929 Great Depression, where suddenly the Nazi party was able to blame all of Germany's economic woes on their Jewish minorities. So given that racism is inherent in capitalism itself, what solution do you think that the Marxists would want to get rid of the racism? Well... Yes, the only way to remove racism from a Marxist point of view is to turn the whole system on its head through a revolution that would replace the economic system. As the proletariat, who were now united by their class position, overthrow the bourgeois oppression, so all racial difference would subside. Here's a Marxist expressing this sentiment in quite politically charged language. Racial liberation won't, won't be won by quotas or with black and brown people in high office. When the first black president of the United States bombed an African country, multiple Middle Eastern countries, and remained passive when racial minorities were being deported and incarcerated on his watch, Barack Obama showed that racism cannot be fought by capitalism. Capital and race were born together. History repeatedly shows how, re how capitalism reproduces racist ideas to divide the working class. Only when people unite together to overthrow capitalism on an internationalist class basis can we begin to see the embers of a world without racism.
So now that we know the general Marxist view of ethnic inequality, let's consider some positive and negative evaluations. Firstly, let's acknowledge some key strengths that Marxism has in this area. What Marxism does well is it does explain quite neatly the intersection between ethnicity and class. It explains well how ethnicity does have quite a lot of overlap with class inequality and shows us the economic structure that can underpin ethnic inequality. It also acts as a fairly decent explanation as to why people do increase in terms of racial discrimination and prejudice during times of economic crisis. Not many other theories even seek to explain this. But there are a number of weaknesses with the Marxist approach. Cultural explanations would point out that Marxism being a structural explanation fails to recognize that there are differences in culture between many ethnic minorities and the host ethnic majority. Also as ever, Marxism focuses too heavily on that class distinction between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, failing to recognize that actually ethnicity is a very distinctive characteristic in of itself and that sometimes ethnic inequality can be more pervasive than class inequality. And finally, their solution to ethnic inequality, that of overturning capitalism itself, has at least been attempted a few times and in every single circumstance has never led to a total eradication of racism and ethnic inequality. There's also a specific study which criticizes the Marxist approach. Pilkington argues that Marxism sees ethnic minorities as a monolith, as a giant grouping of people with very little diversity. Marxism fails to recognize that actually, particularly British Asians, but many other minorities are doing exceptionally well. And many ethnic minorities rise to become the top of many workplaces. Not to mention that many British Asians are excelling in the British education system. So it's time for some final thoughts. Marxism is a structural conflict theory. So it's going to be slightly different to the explanations that we looked at before we um, closed the college. It sees race or, or race inequality not as the fault of the people experiencing it. So nothing to do with their language or their background or their cultures or their traditions but it sees it as being part of the broader conflict between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Now, it's up to you whether you think that's a very kind of reductionist, simplistic argument that essentially attaches everything down to your class position, um, or whether you think it's only saying that because of its legitimacy, um, if it's actually a genuine argument. Um, so next lesson, we'll look at some more specific studies. We'll look at um, expanding some of the studies that you might have in your course back and getting some detail on those. And then perhaps some specific evaluations of those. So I hope you enjoyed, or at least tolerated, the format of this video. Uh, let me know if you've enjoyed it through email. Um, so then I know if I'm doing something right or not. Um, do make sure to check out the reading on Moodle. On screen, I should be showing you how to go about finding them. They'll be in the remote learning section on the Moodle page. Also, those of you that perhaps didn't get a chance to take your course booklets home, there is a online version in the super curricular section of the Moodle page. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and I'll see you on Wednesday.